Hey everyone, Ryan here. Welcome to this brand new series on head and neck anatomy. Now we're gonna cover a lot of great content here and this material appears on the integrated national board dental exam. It also appears on the part one board exam and it also comes up on a lot of other exams, both medical and dental. Now that being said, there are a lot of great resources out there to learn anatomy and I'll be posting and referencing those resources throughout this series if you ever wanna check them out for some more high quality information. But my job here is to present this information so that it's easy to understand and gives you the high yield facts that you need to know for your dental board exams. So with that, let's get started with some embryology. So we're gonna start from the very beginning, that being the germinal stage, otherwise known as the egg stage. Now this is from fertilization to the second week after fertilization. This is also when a miscarriage is most likely to happen. Now as we go through the steps of this process, I'm gonna have in the top right the week that we're currently in. And that week number is based off the starting time point being fertilization. And fertilization occurs when the sperm and egg unite in the fallopian tube to create a diploid cell called a zygote. Before this though, ovulation had to happen, which refers to the release of an egg from the ovary. Now over the next few days, that zygote cleaves into a ball of two cells and then four cells and then eight cells and so on to form what's called a morula. That morula will eventually develop an inner cavity or space called a blastocele at which point it becomes a blastula. It can also be called a blastocyst in mammals. That blastocyst is going to eventually implant itself into the uterine wall. Implantation occurs when the blastula contacts the endometrium, or that uterine wall. Now we're still in week one here, but the blastula is going to get a little bit more complex. So we have an embryo blast which refers to the inner cell mass that's in green that will become much of the embryo proper. So basically it's going to be differentiating and dividing into cells that become much of what we consider the embryo. There's also the trophoblast, that's this outer purple layer, and that outer cell mass will form much of the placenta. So let's zoom in on this blastocyst and get a little closer look. So now we are two weeks in, and at two weeks, we now have two layers. It's an easy way to think of it. Week two, we have two layers. And that inner cell mass becomes a bilaminar disc that consists of those two layers, an epiblast and a hypoblast. So if we look at this image, we have two cell layers right at the center comprising this disc. The upper layer is the epiblast. This lower layer is the hypoblast. Now you also notice two cavities that have formed here. This white cavity up here is called the amniotic cavity and that will house the developing baby. The yolk sac cavity is this yellow one down here and that will provide nutrients and gas exchange before the placenta eventually takes over and that placenta, remember, is derived from the trophoblast from the last slide. So the epiblast is going to do most of the work here. It's going to become the three germ layers of the eventual embryo. The hypoblast, not so much. It's going to disappear and not really contribute to a whole lot. Amniotic cavity and yolk sac cavity, we talked about those. And there's also what's called a primitive node and primitive streak on the dorsal surface on the caudal side of the embryo, which basically identifies the midline. It separates right from left. We'll get a closer look at what that actually looks like in the next slide. Also notice at this point in the process, implantation is now complete. The uh, entire egg is completely within the endometrium now. Also by the end of the second week, we have this uh, space that's kind of surrounding the uh, developing egg. Uh, 
That's called the extra embryonic coelom or chorionic cavity. And as that cavity expands, we eventually have um, this connecting stalk, which eventually becomes the umbilical cord that is suspending this developing egg. So for week three, let's zoom in on this part of the diagram, the most exciting part where most of the action is happening. So now that we're three weeks in, we have three layers. So remember week two, we had the epiblast and hypoblast. In week three, we now have three layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. But first, now we have to talk about a new period that we're in. We're no longer in the egg stage, now we're in the embryonic period, which goes from the third week to the eighth week after fertilization. So now we can call this the embryo. Now during this embryonic period, this is when the organ systems are being established, and it's also when major malformations can be caused by genetic or environmental insults, things like alcohol or retinoids. And so to start this off, we have this process called gastrulation. This refers to a transition from a single sheet of cells to three distinct germ layers. Again, we have the ectoderm in blue here, and that's on the dorsal side of this embryo. It's going to contribute it to things like the epidermis, the skin, the nervous system, the teeth, and the facial skeleton. So really, really important stuff here. And the surface ectoderm specifically is going to form the enamel. It's kind of more this part of the ectoderm and more this part. We're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about neurulation in week four, but the neural crest is going to form the rest of the tooth structures. I talk more about tooth development, odontogenesis, in the first video of my pedi pediatric series, so go check that one out if you haven't already. Also notice this part right here that those arrows are pointing to, that is the primitive streak, and this little tiny dot at the end is the primitive node. Now these things are located, again, on the caudal side of the embryo, that's the tail side of the embryo on the dorsal surface. And so that is just a really important kind of landmark to determine right from left, and it's mediating a lot of this uh, development process. So to cover the rest, mesoderm contributes to body skeleton, so everything but the facial skeleton, all the muscles, all the connective tissue, and then that leaves endoderm to do the lining of the hollow organ systems, like your gastrointestinal tract, for instance. This is a really good um, image from BioNinja and talks about the different cells that differentiate from these different, these three different germ layers. A nice little image there. So this is, a, this is a really difficult thing to visualize, but these images do a very nice job of showing what goes on next from the transition from week three into week four. So here we have the ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm that we just looked at. And on the right, we have a few days later, it says day 25. It's a little bit more further along in development. It's also a different view. So the left, we have a cross-sectional slice and we're kind of peeking in from the, the caudal side, dorsals up here, ventrals down here. Now on the right, we also have dorsal up here, ventral here, but we're looking at a side view. So cranial is up here, caudal is down this way. And so really on the left, we're taking like a cross section through this image. Now how this works is a lot of things are going on right around here. And that's where that epiblast layer started. Remember that epiblast contributes to all three germ layers. So that layer is going crazy and it's producing ectoderm cells that get migrated here. It's producing endoderm cells that are being migrated here. And it's producing mesoderm cells that stay down here in the middle, but they also spread out and create these um, nice little protective membranes and coverings um, and there's a, just a lot going on, a lot of differentiating going on. Now the right image, like I said, it's a little bit further along in development. So 
kind of what happens structurally to get to this point. This is a very different looking thing. And what happens is this ectoderm in all three planes of space kind of grows these appendages almost, and it grows out and eventually is going to pinch in on this endoderm, kind of like a claw game, like you'd see at a boardwalk or an arcade getting a prize. And so it's going to push on either side of that endoderm, and it's going to pinch a little piece, and it's going to involute into the actual embryo. So this is the pinching off point. That little piece that's getting pinched up here becomes the gut, the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut over here. The rest that gets left behind becomes the yolk sac. So that's basically what's going on here is there's this ectoderm that's pinching the endoderm and it's able to um, get that endoderm internalized and you can start to see how that might contribute to the lining of the hollow organs within that body. So a lot of complex things happening in this week three to four transition period. Hopefully this visualization and explanation helps you out. The next, we're gonna zoom in on what's going on right at this part here. So now we're in week four, and this is the neurulation process. Neurulation is happening in week four, whereas gastrulation happened in week three. So neurulation refers to the process where this flat neural plate rolls into a tube, kind of like a yoga mat that's being rolled up. And so I want to call your attention back to this picture where I drew that black line. Again, we're looking at the caudal side of the embryo with that primitive node and primitive streak here. For neurulation, it's happening on the same structure, but it's happening on the cranial side. It's happening on the cranial side on the dorsal surface, but on the cranial side of that embryo. So this is that same structure we were just looking at, just on the cranial side. So we start with a neural plate that's in purple here, and a notochord, which isn't shown, but it's a little tube uh, derived from mesoderm that's sitting uh, below everything going on here. The notochord uh, is the signaling device, it's signaling this plate to start folding and start this process, and that notochord is going to eventually become the vertebral column. So again, think of this plate kind of like a yoga mat, and you're bringing the ends together, allowing that middle portion to sag down. Now those edges in green, once they come meeting together, are called the neural fold. The neural folds. That's and the sagging area in purple is called the neural groove. So we have the neural plate, then we have the neural fold and the neural groove in this drawing. Now that right and left fold eventually converge into a point pinching off into a tube of ectoderm tissue, and that tube is called the neural tube. The top of it that's left behind, these blue ends that eventually uh, meet together, contributes to the epidermis. Now note that that green portion is very special, and it's, it stays together, and it's called the neural crest. The neural crest, that's what used to be the neural fold, that part that actually pinched together and stayed on top of the neural tube. So that neural crest consists of cells that are going to migrate all over the place and contribute to some really important structures that are far away from the dorsal surface. So again, this top part is the dorsal surface, it's the epidermis, and those neural crest cells are going to be able to be sent out all over the place to contribute to uh, all sorts of structures. Uh, a lot of the tooth, again, is formed from neural crest cells. So as all of this is happening, the aortic arch vessels and corresponding pharyngeal arches and somites form in a cranial to caudal sequence. So these are some really important things that we're going to spend most of the rest of the video talking about. The pharyngeal arches are segments by which the head and the neck develop. They start with we start with six pharyngeal arches and we go down to five. The somites are segments by which the body develops, so the rest of the body. We start with about 
uh, anywhere between 42 and 44 somites, we eventually end with 37 individual somites. So five pharyngeal arches, 37 somites. And they develop in a cranial to caudal sequence from head to tail. All right, so following neural tube closure, this buccopharyngeal membrane or oral membrane perforates. So it finally opens, allowing a communication with the outside world between the, the outside world and the foregut. This primitive oral cavity is called the stomodium or stomatodium. It's a really, really important word and comes up on board exams all the time. Some other good terms I wanted to point out for you, the optic placode, that's the primitive eye. The otic placode, somewhere up here, is the primitive ear. It pops up a little bit later in development. And the blastopore is where the cloacal membrane eventually perforates to communicate with the hindgut to create the primitive anal cavity. All right, so let's focus on the pharyngeal arches. They're also called the branchial arches, branchial for gills. And they're a series of these, they kind of look like gills, but they're not. They're a series of externally visible anterior tissue bands lying under the early brain that give rise to head and neck structures. The sixth arch, you can't see here. You can only see one, two, three, four, maybe five, but five doesn't stay around for a whole lot, for a whole long time. And eventually we're just left with arch one, two, three, four, and six that contribute to really important structures, all of which we're gonna talk about very soon. So each of these arches contains uh, very specific structures. And if we're looking at, uh, we're basically looking at a cross section of the embryo, and we see that each of these physical rib-like structures, rib-like arches, has an internal area, this internal area in yellow or orange that is called in a pouch, and that's endoderm tissue. We have a mesenchymal core that's on the inside of each of these arches. You can see it blown up on the right side. That's made of mesoderm and neural crest cells, and that's gonna to contribute to arteries, nerves, muscles, and cartilage. We also have an uh, outside layer this is an external ectodermal cleft. So this is coming from ectoderm tissue. So we have endoderm on the inside of each of these arches, ectoderm on the outside of each of these arches, and each of those arches has all of these components, artery, nerve, muscle, and cartilage. So let's unpack this a bit more in the next slide and talk about specifics for each arch. All right, so I cannot stress how high yield this table is going to be for you. There are so many possible test questions that can be asked on this material, and they certainly come up all the time. So a lot of this is honestly gonna be just kind of rote memorization using flashcards and things like that. I'm gonna to try to talk about some things that might help you remember some of these things a little bit better. So. How this is laid out, we have the five important pharyngeal arches, one, two, three, four, and six. And then we have the nerve, the bones, the cartilage, the muscles, and the ligaments associated with each of those arches. So I wanna go through the cranial nerves really quick. We're going to have a separate video talking about each of the cranial nerves and what they actually do. So don't worry too much about the function part of it, but certainly remember these numbers and these cranial nerves because it's, it's just so important. It's going to inform a lot of the later things we talk about. So pharyngeal arch one is innervated by cranial nerve five. Pharyngeal arch two, cranial nerve seven, three goes with nine, and four and six are both innervated by cranial nerve 10. So five is trigeminal, seven is facial, nine is the glossopharyngeal, and 10 is the vagus nerve. Again, we'll talk about the specifics a little bit later, but if you can remember 5, 7, 9, 10, 5, 7, 9, 10, this is so, so important. All right, so let's go now across the rows. The first pharyngeal arch is also called the mandibular arch, 
this it's in this uh, red or orange let's call it orange because I see red down here a little bit more so the orange arch here is the first one and it's called the mandibular for a good reason some of the things that are going to come from this arch are the Meckel's cartilage Meckel's cartilage maxilla mandible malleus do you see where I'm going with this all of these M's are coming from the mandibular arch also the the incus is another inner ear bone also the zygoma and the temporal bone of the skull also being contributed from this first arch over for muscles we have the all of the muscles of mastication I call them the moms muscles of mastication are the masseter the temporalis and the medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid we're gonna have a separate video uh, just talking about those muscles but those are all innervated by cranial nerve 5 the third division of cranial nerve 5 to be exact and they're all coming from pharyngeal arch 1 also the mylohyoid is coming from this arch so just look at all the M's I think that's a really nice quick way to remember some of these things uh, for this first row also the anterior digastric and these two tensor muscles the sphenomandibular ligament is the ligament coming from this one so again a lot of uh, kind of a lot of commonalities among that row for the second one hyoid it's also called the hyoid arch this one is coming up with the Reichert's cartilage the stapes, that's the third inner ear bone that we got left out from the first arch. The styloid process, oid rhymes with hyoid. Uh, and the upper half of the hyoid body and the lesser cornu or lesser horns of that hyoid bone. The muscles of facial expression, the MFE, come from this one. They're all innervated by the facial nerve. And then we have the posterior digastric. So the anterior digastric um, muscles were for the first row, the posterior for the second. We also have the stylohyoid muscle and the stapedius muscle that goes along with the stapes. And we have the stylohyoid ligament. So a lot of you know, oids and hyoids that appear in that row as well. So hopefully some of those things can kind of stick out to you and help you at least fill in some of this table. Because honestly, this is like one of those really high yield things that I would almost just reproduce on your scrap paper as soon as you start the exam because so many things could uh, refer back to this. The hy hyoid arch is in blue on this right image and then three is in yellow, four is in red, and finally six is in green down here. So uh, I won't go through all the rest of this but you certainly uh, can look at this and memorize it uh, one thing that's a little nice is that with the third arch, there's only one muscle to remember, no ligaments, and the skeleton is a little pretty straightforward. If you get the, the second row done and you know it's upper half of the hyoid and the lesser horns, you just have to do the opposite, lower half of the hyoid and the greater horns to fill in that arch. So there's some things that can help you out with reproducing this table. Again, cannot stress enough how high yield this is. Now some people ask, is there a fifth arch? Well, yes and no. In humans, the fifth pharyngeal arch exists only transiently during this embryogenesis process. Eventually it goes away and doesn't contribute to a whole lot. Kind of like uh, the hypoblast that we saw before. All right, so once we understand the previous table, this table makes a whole lot more sense. So this one looks at the ectodermal clefts and the endodermal pouches that we talked about before. And also I, I included the neurogenic placodes. These are focal thickenings of the ectoderm layer that give rise to, to neurons essentially. So let's look at the placodes first because I think they're actually the most straightforward. So remember I talked about the cranial nerves for each arch, five, seven, nine, ten. 10. Well, guess what? For arch one, we have the trigeminal ganglion, which goes with cranial nerve five. The geniculate ganglion is part of cranial nerve seven. And then we have the inferior sensory ganglion of the ninth cranial nerve, inferior sensory ganglion of the 10th cranial nerve. So if you just remember five, seven, nine, ten, 10, you already have everything you need with that column. 
All right, now let's go over to the clefts. So I just want to clarify the cleft of arch one is, is really between arch one and two. So each of these clefts and pouches are kind of between the arches. So, so cleft one is between these two, cleft two is between those two, etc. So they're really listed below the arch of the row that they're in. So the cleft of arch one, which is really between arch one and two, is the external auditory meatus. That's this opening right over here. That's the opening of the outer ear. And as you'll soon see, the outer ear develops from three segments of pharyngeal arch one and three segments of pharyngeal arch two. So in the fact that the opening is between these two arches makes perfect sense. Of course, there's going to be one on the right side and one on the left side of the developing embryo. Clefts two, three, and four all contribute to the cervical sinus, which is a temporary space that eventually goes away. However, if it doesn't go away, there can be remnants of this sinus located laterally along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle of the neck. And these uh, cysts that, that don't go away, it's called a branchial cyst or branchial sinus. So if something goes wrong there, that's what that becomes. Lastly, the pouches. So there's a bit more going on in this column, but I promise that it'll all make sense. So remember, cleft one uh, was for the outer ear opening. Now guess what pouch one is? It's the inner ear opening. So right over here, we have the uh, eustachian or auditory tube and the tympanic cavity in there. So that's all part of the inner ear and that's gonna obviously connect with the outer ear opening. So together they form the entire ear canal. Now for uh, pouch number two, we move further down along the back of the throat essentially and this is where we get to the palatine tonsils, the palatine tonsils. Now for pouch three and four, it's where things get a little bit weird. Basically everything in this area migrates and descends from its starting position. And some things descend further down than others. So some of these things aren't gonna make a whole lot of sense where they start, it'll make more sense where they finish. So pouch three makes the thymus, which is an immune organ where the T cells mature. And so here's the thymus over here, and that's gonna go way down. That's gonna migrate way down to eventually sit between the two lungs. Now also from this arch, or from this pouch, I should say, is the inferior um, parathyroids the inferior parathyroid glands, one on either side that are embedded within the thyroid gland. And these make a parathyroid hormone to regulate calcium and phosphorus levels in the body. And those also descend, those also descend, but not quite as far as the thymus does. Now pouch four contributes to the superior parathyroid glands. Again, one on either side of the thyroid. And that's the confusing part because they don't migrate as far down as the inferior ones did. So the inferior start out higher and then end up lower. The superior ones start out lower, but they don't have to migrate down as far. So they stay on top of where those inferior glands end up. The same thing with the ultimobranchial body. That's contributes to the parafollicular cells or C-cells of the actual thyroid gland. Those stay a little bit closer to where they developed into where the thyroid gland eventually was going to end up. Now, if one of these uh, pharyngeal pouches doesn't close properly, you can end up with a tunnel of tissue or a branchial fistula that extends from a pharyngeal pouch to the surface of the neck, so a branchial fistula. So a cyst is if a cleft messes up 
a fistula is if a pouch messes up. All right, so a lot of information there. Hopefully all of that made sense. I know some of this stuff going on with the third and fourth pouches is a little bit confusing, but as long as you figure out you know, where they uh, start versus where they end up, uh, it makes a little bit more sense. All right, so how about the pituitary gland? Well, remember back to our week four setup over here where we had the, um, the roof of the oral cavity. We have the roof of the oral cavity. The oral cavity is the stomodium. And the floor of the forebrain are essentially right next to each other. And each of these things contributes to the pituitary gland formation. So a nice image from Teach Me Anatomy. We have the floor of the forebrain and the roof of the stomatodium or stomodium. Those are synonymous right next to each other. Both of these things are going to um, basically fold up and the Rathke's pouch is an evagination at the roof of the developing mouth close to that buccopharyngeal membrane. That is eventually going to give rise to the anterior pituitary. And then up here, the roof of the forebrain, we have the diencephalon, that's the caudal part of the forebrain, and that evaginates downward to merge with the anterior pituitary and becomes the posterior pituitary. So the anterior part originates from oral ectoderm, the posterior part originates from neural ectoderm. So pretty cool how that, how that happens. So the pituitary gland developed from two entirely different tissues, and the tongue is another cool example because it's one organ that develops from four different pharyngeal arches. And that explains why its innervation pattern is essentially all over the place. We'll have a separate video uh, dedicated again to all the cranial nerves, but for now, let's just cover how the tongue feels and moves. So the first two columns, again, should look really similar. Again, we just follow the pattern, five, seven, nine, 10, for those uh, four arches. We also have a fifth source that I wanna mention for the tongue being not an arch, but actually occipital myotomes. That's part of the somites that develop into muscles. So let's move over to a, a diagram I made over on the right, and we'll start with general sensation general sensation. So that's things like touch, pain, and temperature. In the anterior two-thirds, that's this bottom part down here, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is innervated by V3. That's the third division or the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. The posterior third, oops, that's up here, is innervated by cranial nerve nine. And then the root or the base of the tongue, as well as the epiglottis, which is way back there, is innervated by cranial nerve 10. And all that stuff is, is reiterated on the chart. This is just a fun little visual tool that I, I like to reproduce uh, on test day. Now for taste, we move over to this column the anterior two-thirds is innervated by cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. So that's different, an entirely different nerve is, is responsible for an entirely different sensation in the same region of the tongue. It just blows my mind how cool that is. And then if we go to the posterior third, as well as the base of the tongue, those two things are the same as they were for sensation. So cranial nerve nine is responsible for the posterior third, cranial nerve 10 for the base, the root, whatever you want to call it, those are synonymous, as well as the epiglottis. Now, how about for motor, for actually moving the, the tongue around? Well, the vagus nerve, once again, plays a role here in innervating what's called the pallidoglossus muscle. That is a tongue muscle that's innervated by cranial nerve 10. So 10 is the only cranial nerve here that does all three of these things for the tongue. However, that's the only tongue muscle that a pharyngeal arch contributes to, and the rest of the tongue muscles are from those occipital somites that are innervated by cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve. 
Again, we're, we're going to talk more about cranial nerves. We'll also talk more about these tongue muscles in a, an entirely uh, separate video. We're focusing more on the embryology part of it here. Again, notice that the pituitary, the tongue, and also a lot of the other things we're going to talk about in this video, all of this is happening starting week four. Week four is a really big week where a lot of organ development is going on. How about the thyroid gland? The thyroid gland. So we talked about this a little bit already. We talked about how the um, parafollicular cells originate and how they descend. What about the rest of the thyroid gland? Well, it has a very interesting path of development. So it actually develops from tissues at the base of the tongue, which actually makes perfect sense. The thyroid cartilage comes from arch four, and the vast majority of the thyroid comes from the cleft under arch four. So it's only natural that the thyroid would originate from tissue of the tongue that's innervated by the vagus nerve, which is also part of arch four. So all of that kind of connects together. So uh, from this view, this is the same image I had in the last slide, but I've just remasked it for some anatomy labeling. So we have the median sulcus goes across the tongue. We have these big circumvallate papillae that kind of form a, a V shape at the end of our tongue. And then we have this little dot here called the foramen cecum. And that's a vestigial depression. And it starts out as the development site for the primitive thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland starts right there at the back of the tongue and it descends through the neck. So it descends and it goes quite a distance carrying with it the thyroglossal duct, the thyroglossal duct. And that makes sense because thyro thyroid and glossal for tongue, all that um, goes together. And that stays connected to the foramen cecum on the surface of the tongue. The thyroid's uh, pyramidal gland, that's right at the center, right here, it kind of sticks up a little bit, usually extends up along the path of this duct at the midline. And that's a result of the travel that the thyroid gland had to take. An undescended thyroid gland might sit at the base of the tongue as a lingual thyroid. So that's pathology related to a failure of this development process. How about the ear? This happens a little bit later, about week six, and it develops from six individual auricular hillocks from the first and second uh, pharyngeal arches. And that's three hillocks on either side of that ear opening. So three from first arch, three from the second arch. And that little opening is going to happen right between those. So it all, again, it all kind of comes together, which is really, really the cool thing about all of this. So um, one here becomes the, the tragus. Uh, we have three up here becomes the helix. Four is the anti-helix, six is the lobe, and you, you don't have to remember all of those things, but you can see how kind of the one, two, and three form a good portion of that. Four, five, and six form this portion, and so you have the, the external auditory meatus that gets left in between those two groups, and that's how it all kind of works together. Now, important thing to know for a possible uh, case question on a dental board exam. Retinoic acid, also known as Accutane, is a medication that's used for severe acne, and it can cause first and second arch defects that manifest, if, if the mother's taking it during this stage of development, it can cause defects such as microtia, which is a small ear, and it's frequently accompanied by micronathia, which is a small mandible. Again, in the context of embryology, it makes sense because they all share the same arch. Portions of the ear and the entire mandible are coming from arch number one. All right, so we've covered uh, this content in our orthodontics series on cleft lip and palate. I'll cover it again from an embryology standpoint. So a cleft is the result of a failure of fusion of tissue during early development. And we're, we're still in the embryo stage here. 
So let's start with cleft lip. Lip formation occurs during weeks four, five, and six. And the lip is derived from medial nasal prominence, the medial nasal prominence that's in red in this diagram, and the maxillary prominence, which is in green. The lateral nasal prominence in blue forms the ala or the sides of the nose. Now cleft lip occurs when the maxillary prominence fails to fuse with the medial nasal prominence anteriorly. So if these two uh, primitive tissues fail to fuse properly, that's how you get a cleft lip. Now due to the location of these prominences and where they're fusing, that's going to typically result in either a left side or a right side, a unilateral cleft, but not always. Sometimes it can occur bilaterally, or sometimes even at the midline. Now let's go to cleft palate. The palate is a little bit later. Primary palate forms at around six weeks in utero. The secondary palate forms at around eight weeks in utero. So lip is four to six, palate is six to eight. The primary palate is this red part up front. Uh, it also comes from the medial nasal prominence. Now we're looking at a, an axial view, looking up at this uh, baby's uh, palate. And so the primary pa palate can also be called the premaxilla, the intermaxilla, or the incisive bone. And it carries lateral incisor to lateral incisor which explains why someone who has cleft palate often has missing or malformed lateral incisors because those teeth develop right next to where this junction is. The secondary palate is everything else. It's the green part. Originally, these two palatal shelves, one and two, are developing vertically. They're actually located lateral to the tongue in a vertical orientation. So think of them like doors that are swung wide open. And as the oral cavity grows taller, the tongue relatively moves downward and it allows those shelves to close to a horizontal position and fuse at the midline like you see here. Now the palatal shelves begin to fuse starting starting at the incisive foramen, which is right here, and they will zip together caudally or posteriorly. So a lot of things happen in this kind of cranial to caudal or anterior to posterior uh, development direction. Now an incomplete cleft palate occurs when the palatal shelves fail to fuse with each other. A complete cleft palate, so that would be you know, if the failure to fusion ended up like that. Now you could also have a complete cleft palate, where in addition to that, the primary palate fails to fuse with the palatal shelves. So there's a clean break all the way through there between the left and right sides in a complete palatal cleft. Now once you hit the end of week eight, the baby is considered a fetus. And we could go on and on with embryogenesis, but the rest of it is just not as high yield for dental board exams. So we're going to stop right here. Now I do wanna bring in some clinical stuff because I know everyone's always asking me about some case questions and can we see more patient cases? Well, here we have a case of a child with DeGeorge syndrome. It's a rare syndrome that's caused by genetic or environmental influence on neural crest cells during development. So again, things like alcohol or retinoids could play a role. It's known as third and fourth pouch syndrome. And now we have all the information we need to explain this. It affects the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches. If we go back to our chart, we see the thymus and the parathyroid glands are going to get hit the hardest. And that's exactly what we see in its manifestation. A great mnemonic to remember for this one is CATCH-22. CATCH-22, so the C stands for cardiac abnormalities, A stands for abnormal facies, that's things like uh, a cleft palate, short philtrum, small mandible, hypertelorism, the eyes are far apart. Uh, the T stands for thymic aplasia, again the thymus is getting hit hard because this is affecting 
among other things, the third and fourth pouches, cleft palate, and hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia results from a bad a parathyroid gland, which means that there's no parathyroid hormone being produced. If there's no parathyroid hormone, you can't increase your blood calcium levels, so the blood calcium stays low, which is hypocalcemia. And then it involves a 22Q11 chromosomal deletion. And so catch-22 is a really nice, like, clean mnemonic to remember for DeGeorge syndrome. And just to wrap things up, I just wanted to stress to you guys that it's so important for embryology and really everything anatomy to draw it out. To draw it out, make nice, clean drawings and use lots of colors and play around with uh, different views and I think that's the best way to learn this stuff so I just did this quick sketch uh, a few minutes before I recorded just to show you what you can kind of come up with and this is just going through the things we talked about starting from ovulation through uh, fertilization the zygote morula blastula with that cavity the embryoblast which will become the epiblast and hypoblast that epiblast will kind of go crazy, become our three germ layers that we have here. Then we have the pinching off of that gut to, to form uh, this more familiar cross-section with the neural tube, notochord, and the primitive gut. So stuff like this, it's just so helpful to draw it out. Look at those diagrams uh, that I included throughout the video and kind of make your own interpretations and drawings as you go along and study this stuff. All right, well, that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.